not stand together and turn to Acts chapter 6. And uh, you may wonder why we stand up and sit down so much. That's to keep you awake. Amen. And so Acts chapter 6, we're going to read the first seven verses. And I want to preach this morning, or attempt to preach this morning, on this subject today. Are you filled with faith? Are you filled with faith? Get your Bible, if you would, and look at Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. The Bible says that in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration or ministry. Verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. I want you to notice that phrase there, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, <coughs> and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they prayed, they laid their hands on them. Look at verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon the preaching of God's word. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. We thank you, dear God, so much today for your word. We pray, dear God, that by your spirit you would speak to our hearts this morning. I pray, dear God, that you would increase our faith. Lord, I think of Jesus when he spoke to the disciples in the middle of the storm, and he said, where is your faith? Lord, I believe that so often you would address us by your spirit in the same way to ask us the question, where is your faith? Lord, increase our faith this morning. And Lord, I pray you'd bless this preaching this morning. I just commit it to you. I pray, Lord, that you would, by, by your Holy Spirit, just look down upon us and minister to us this morning through the Word of God. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And for his sake we pray, amen. You may be seated. As we look at our text this morning, the book of Acts chapter 6, you need to understand that the church has now grown phenomenally. From the 120 there on the day of Pentecost, and then, of course, obviously, the 3,000 that were saved and baptized and added. And some people, some Bible students, believe that that was just a mention of the men, not to mention their families that were saved. I don't know whether that's accurate or not. But we do know that the church went from addition to multiplication, to the point of where there were eventually thousands and thousands of new converts and believers in Jesus Christ. What a grand opening. Now, I have a dear friend named Dr. Dennis Brown who's been with the Lord now for many years, and he said, you always need to remember in a Baptist church that the ministry of the deacon was not needed of the church had 3,000 members, amen? And uh, I'm not saying you have to have 3,000 members now deacons, but I think so often we rush in this matter of deacons, and yet the qualifications for deacons are laid out for us right here in Scripture. And I'll be very honest with you, over the years of being a pastor, I've met very few deacons that really fulfill all of these characteristics. And I, I, my, my trust is, my prayer is that God would give us some men within our church uh, perhaps that, that have that calling of their life to serve in the church as a deacon. Now the deacons are servants to the servant. He said, well, who is the servant? Well, the pastor, amen. He served the little church. And the word deacon literally means a servant, servant. It's actually a Greek word. And the word literally is a word to be a servant to the servants. He said, well, who does the deacon serve? Well, he serves, number one, the Lord. Number two, a deacon serves the pastor. And of course, certainly, he serves the church, the local church. And so, the office of deacon, there are only two biblical offices in the New Testament church. And that is the bishops, the pastor, and the deacons. And the church has to have a pastor, but the church does not have to have deacons. Uh, deacons was created out of necessity. And obviously, if there are men within our church that feel that call, and they, and they fit that call, then I believe that men can be appointed by the church to serve as deacons. And we certainly uh, have needed that in our local church. And I think that's something this year we should, we should be praying about and considering as a church and seeing men serve in that office. Now, that's not really my whole subject today. 
But think about the think about the office here, the kind of men that God chose. Let's look at it just for a moment here in the Word of God. The kind of men that God chose to be servants of God, to be servants of the local church, and to serve their pastor within the local congregation. The Bible says here in verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. That means these would be men that have a good testimony in the community. Uh, these were men that were known to be men of integrity and men of character, of honest report. In other words, the kind of men that, that if you shook their hand, their word was law. Amen? Uh, honest report. And so men of honest report. Second of all, the Bible says, full of the Holy Ghost. Now there is evidence that when a man of God is a spirit-filled believer. Uh, don't tell me you're a spirit-filled believer if you're not a witness in Christian. Amen? I believe that every spirit-filled Christian is a witness in Jesus, uh, a Christian. In fact, when you're filled, filled with the Holy Spirit, you have a good case if you can't help yourself. Amen? I mean, you're looking for opportunities when you are a spirit-filled Christian to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the Holy Spirit just gives you a holy boldness to witness. And I think about two of these deacons that, that God mentions here in the Word of God, they were far more than a lot of deacons are in churches today. They were evangelists. I think about Philip and I think about Stephen. Stephen became the first martyr of the churches. He publicly and boldly filled with the Holy Ghost. God and preached the Word of God to the very generation who had rejected Christ. And of course became the first martyr of the church. And then I think about Philip. How that God sent him down to Samaria. And how God used him in a mighty way. And so these men were gifted men in the church. The deacons were certainly uh, more widely used of God than what many deacons are in many churches today. In fact, I think we need to get back to understand the, the full biblical role of, of what the deacon truly can be. And so I think about these men. They were preachers. They had both Philip and Stephen. Now the Bible doesn't mention a lot about the other men. I'm sure that they had great accomplishments as well. But, but these two that stand out here. And so we see the list there, Philip and Stephen and Prochorus, and if you, don't, if, you, if you read those names, that's a good exercise and fanatics for you this morning, amen. But Prochorus and, and Nicanor and Timon and, and Parmenius, Par Parmesan and Nicholas of Antioch, all of these men God used in a mighty way. Now, what were the results of their, of their ministry? Well, as a result of their ministry, the church began to grow and began to prosper even more. Uh, when, they were, when they were fulfilling their God-ordained role, it brought a blessing to the church in Jerusalem. What was the blessing? Well, look what the Bible says in verse 7. And the word of God increased. And the number of disciples were like Jerusalem greatly. Now why? Because the deacons began to assume responsibilities within the church that the apostles no longer then had those full responsibilities. It was not meet that they would have to leave the word of God and to serve tables. And so it, it lifted the apostles from their uh, from the menial work that, that's a part of God's work so that they had the freedom with their time and their energy to place that upon what God had called them to do, which is the ministry of prayer and the Word of God. Uh, the ministry of prayer and the studying and the preaching of God's Word, which is so important. By the way, that doesn't just mean preaching in the church. That means that the apostles were free to evangelize and to preach the gospel with power as they'd done before, and with greater power, and with greater freedom, and greater ability. And so the three results of, of this being fulfilled was the word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied, and the number of, even a great number of the Levitical priests were converted to Jesus Christ. Now I want, to, I want us to focus in a little bit then today, and let's get away from the telescope and go to the microscope today for a minute. And let's focus in on Stephen for a moment here. Let's look at Stephen, if you would, in verse 5. In verse 5, chapter 6, verse 5. The Bible says here in this passage, and Stephen, a man full of faith. Full of faith. You know, one of the greatest needs in our churches today is pastors that are filled with faith. But it's also a need for people to be filled with faith. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid as we look at our country and we look at our churches, and I want to say this today, I want, to, I want you to realize this, and I probably have said it before, but only 9% of churches in America are even growing at all today. Only 9%. That's less than 1 out of 10 churches are growing at all. Of the other, what, 91%, they're either holding their own or they're declining in membership. And they're declining in growth. Sounds to me like the church is suffering from a bad case of, of spiritual paralysis. Amen? 
Since when does the culture dictate what the church does? Amen? You say, well, it's bad out there. Well, you know, if all we do is get to preach about how bad it is, we forget that the Bible says that we're going to look upon the harvest. The Bible says as we look upon the harvest that it is, it is, it is white. It is ready for harvest. But what did Jesus say? He said that the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. You know, this year as a pastor, I think I've gotten telephone calls from at least 20 missionaries since January. At least 20. And that are out of good schools and out of good churches and have a great desire to get on their field. And I mean, I've got, I've got an email box full of, of, of missionary information of men of God who know that God has saved them and that God has called them and has a desire to get on the field and to get out there and to preach the gospel and to plant churches and to do work for God. You know what the problem is? Churches are on decline today and many churches are not taking on new missionaries. And some of them are cutting the missionaries that they have in the midst of a time in our world where there's never been a greater need. I mean, think about world population by itself. Our own country, sadly, is, and I say sadly, is booming the population. The reason why I say badly, sadly, is because it's not by immigration, it's by illegal immigration coming into our country. And that's a misnomer to even use the term illegal immigration, because if you're an immigrant, you're not illegal. If you're illegal, you're not an immigrant. And so, for anyone to mention illegal immigration, there's only one proper way to come into a country, and that's by immigration and, and agreeing that you're going to be a subject and, and understanding your, uh, that you're going to live by the, by the laws of the land. And of course, that's the way people used to come into America. Sadly today, and, and, I, and I say sadly, we've got to lay aside our own laws, okay, as a nation. But, but what is the result? Well, multitudes are coming in from many other countries into our nation. By the way, I heard a statistic that day that was somewhat alarming to me that said that actually there are more Muslims coming into our country than there are from Mexico. And I have no prejudice against either one. Jesus loves everyone. Amen? They all need Christ. Muslims need Jesus. Mexicans need Jesus. And Americans need Jesus. But that, that there's actually more Muslims coming into our country and immigrating into our country or coming in, maybe coming in illegally, than there are even Hispanics coming in from the southern border. And, and so what I'm saying is the mission field is not across the sea. It's here. It's here. And uh, there are people in our city, and even those who have not come into our country, think about the multitudes living right here in Copeland, Indiana, that have never one time had anyone open up the Word of God and give them a clear explanation from Scripture about how to be saved. You would be surprised. I mean, I think most of us sitting in the churches are living in a bubble. I really believe that. And have no conception whatsoever of the real mission field that lies outside the doors of our church. And one reason why you're in a bubble is because you won't get out of the bubble. Because you won't go out and knock on the door. You won't go out and get involved in evangelism. Uh, but once you get out there, you will discover that outside the doors of our churches is a world that is right for the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are people that need the Lord. Well, as I look at this, we see here, Stephen was a man that God chose. <coughs> and the Bible says here, that he was a man that was filled, he was filled with faith. He was filled with faith. This is such a need today. Uh, the, book of, the, the, book of, uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6, the Bible says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For him to come unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. And then well, what God is saying in his word very plainly here is this, that an ingredient that is absolutely necessary in the life of every Christian is faith. Have you ever thought about this today? You would not even be saved if it wasn't for faith. Now what is the source of faith? Well, I think we understand the book of Romans chapter 10 says, So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you come to church and hear the word of God preached, you should walk out the door more filled with faith than when you came in. Your faith should be increased. Why? Because the Word of God, the hearing of the Word of God. And certainly when we hear preaching of the power of the Spirit, it should, it should light a fire under us as Christians. We should walk out filled with faith. We ought to be more encouraged to pray and see our prayers answered because we've been in God's house. Amen? We ought to walk out more encouraged to witness and to expect something to happen when we witness because of our faith being increased. We ought to leave the church with a greater desire of seeing more missionaries say, It burdens me when I get 20 phone calls from 20 missionaries, all of them fully qualified, fully trained, ready to get on the field, and yet not enough churches in our country.
to support the numbers of missionaries that desire to go and to preach the gospel throughout the world. That ought to be a burden on our heart today. We ought to say, preacher, what can I do? What can I do to help our church to take on more missionaries? Next week we'll hear about that, amen, in our missions conference. And so I'll kind of leave you hanging with that question this morning. But, but the bottom line is we ought to get a burden. And you know, so often it seems as though the church is almost today in America in a state of spiritual depression. I mean, kind of spiritually paralyzed, feeling like, well, why should I bother doing anything because what I do won't make any difference? You know something that will make a difference. You know, there's, there's one thing every Christian can do. You can do what you can. Amen? I love the example of the woman who took the alabaster box and she broke it and she wiped the feet of Jesus with her hair and she broke that box. And Jesus said, everywhere the gospel is preached, that would be a memorial. You know why? He said she had done what she could. I, I'm afraid in our churches there's lots of people that are not doing what they can do. Amen? She had done what she could. And I, I think about this. So often we allow ourselves to become so overwhelmed by the, by the magnitude of what God wants us to do that we forget that what God really wants us to do is every day just reach one person with the gospel. Amen? Every day hand out one track. Every day, at least make some attempt to win this. You know, I think the one reason why God used Dwight L. Moody in the way that he did is because as a young man, he made up his mind to never let the sun set on a day without having witness to at least one person every day. Now, I don't know whether he was able to fulfill that commitment to God or not. I don't know whether ever a day passed that D.L. Moody did not find someone to witness to. I do know that I heard a story one day about the fact that he got in his room where he was preaching and realized that day he had never spoken to anyone personally about Christ. And he went out that very night, like 10 or 11 at night, and he, and he actually went out and won a soul. And uh, because he, he wanted to be sure to be faithful to God in his commitment to every day try to witness to at least one person. He said, well, preacher, I think that's a goal that's too high. Let me ask you a question. What is your goal? You know, there's an old saying, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Amen? That may not be your goal, but you ought to have some goal. You ought to be making for some effort to make some difference for Jesus Christ in Como, Indiana. I mean, as we pass through life, what is more important than the souls of men and women, boys and girls and teenagers that we pass by every day, that are going to spend eternity, either in heaven or hell, based on what they heard that life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? We have to get a burden. We need to get excited about the great commission of Jesus Christ. I think about this. My Savior was willing to walk up Calvary and to bleed and to suffer and to die for me to be saved. Why aren't we willing to do more for Him? I mean, I think it's a lack of love on the part of Christians that will not witness. And you know, some of you sitting in the pew can't even remember the last time you shared with a lost sinner your own testimony of how you got saved. And you couldn't even remember right now when was the last time you had the opportunity of sharing that. And you know why? A lot of times we come into church and we sit like wooden Indians and we can't get excited about anything. It's because we've allowed the, 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 the flame within our own soul to burn so low that it barely gives any light whatsoever. We've just allowed the embers to burn. You know Paul told young Timothy? He said, you need to stir it up. Stir up the gift of God. Anybody that grew up with stones or wood stubs, you know what that means. It can burn low and there's not much heat, but you open up that door and you stir it up and you shake it up and you get the baffle and you begin to put some oxygen in that fire. It begins to glow. It begins Amen. to give. And we know that's what we need today. We need to get fired up for the Lord. Amen? Amen. We need to get some excitement about reaching souls for Jesus Christ. It'll fire you up. Well, this man was a man filled with faith. He was filled with faith. But he was also, look at verse 8 with me, look at your Bible in verse 8. The Bible says in verse 8, and Stephen full of faith and power. Amen. You know, we need more than just faith, we need power. Now, I want you to look at three basic thoughts then today, and I'll be done preaching. I know you like to hear that. But number one, here's the first question, and this is a question I pose to myself as well as you. I don't, I don't preach down to God's people, amen? Every message I preach, I need. And so here's the first question I want to ask you today. Are you and I filled with faith? Are we like Stephen? You say, well, I'm not interested in being a deacon, so I'm not really worried about that. No, every Christian should be filled with faith. Remember the analogy I gave you of the disciples? Jesus was asleep in the boat, and, and the terrible storm arose, and they were bailing water. And Jesus awoke, and they said, Master, don't you care that we're perishing when they woke him up? And Jesus said, where is your faith? I would like to ask the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the year 2050, where is our faith? 
Why do we no longer believe God like we should anymore today? Where are the people of God <coughs> that are filled with faith? Our prayer lives are to be, be filled with faith with no room for doubt. Get your Bible if you want to turn to Mark 11. Turn there with me today. Mark chapter 11. You know, to have prayer without faith is, is, is not going to accomplish anything. And you know, there's a lot of praying that goes on in a lot of churches that I'm afraid doesn't get much higher than the, than the hardwood up there. Amen? Because it's not offered in faith. Look what Jesus said about our prayers and about the matter of faith. Get your Bible and turn here to Mark chapter 11. Now, you might need to get your heart out on this morning. Amen? Because we're going to get to work in the Word of God this morning. But look if you would in chapter 11. Look at chapter 11 and notice with me verse 22. Verse 22. Jesus said this in verse 22. He said, have faith in God. You said, preacher, why should I have faith? Well, there's one simple reason because Jesus told me to. That's enough, isn't it? Amen. He told me to. He said, have faith in God. Now, do you know what the national sin of Israel was? Unbelief. Now, don't you think that if the physical seed of Israel struggle with unbelief, that sometimes the spiritual seed of the church does as well? Amen. Do you not in your own life have to admit that sometimes you struggle with this matter of unbelief? We all do. The book of Hebrews chapter 4 says, The word that was preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So that's an ingredient that is needed. So Jesus called his disciples, which were Jews, he said, Have faith in God. Now look at verse 23. For verily I say to you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, by the way, the mountain represents anything that seems too big for you to get over, to get around, or to get through. Do you have mountains in your life today? You may have some. You said, what's a mountain? Well, that's what you wake up in the middle of life thinking about and trying to solve. Amen. That, that's that situation, that problem that, that, that you take and you take to God in prayer. And a mountain represents an obstacle. It represents something difficult to get through. I don't know if you've ever, ever had the occasion of going down to Cumberland Gap, Tennessee. But literally hundreds of settlers traveled from the east to the west through Cumberland Gap. You say, why did they go through there? Because it was a, it was a place you could get through the mountains. It's not very easy to pull a wagon. You know, we, we drive through that country today on the ease of modern highways and roads, but we don't realize the amount of work and labor it took to build those roads because the mountains are difficult to get over and to get through. Amen? I think about the tunnels I drive through. We drive through the tunnels. We go through Middlesboro, Kentucky, down into Cumberland Gap, Tennessee, and we drive through a tunnel that's a mile long. And you're in that tunnel for quite a while. I don't really like being in tunnels. Do you like that? Because I'm always thinking, when I'm driving through a tunnel, tunnel, what's going to happen if an earthquake happens while I'm in here? I don't like I'm kind of claustrophobic, and I don't like the idea of being buried alive in a tunnel. Amen? I understand I'll go to glory that quick. Amen? But, but the, whole, the whole idea of that, but I think about what the labor it took to tunnel through there. I think about the hours of time it took to tunnel through a mountain. But Jesus, look what he said about mountains. Mountains that seem so difficult and so hard for us with faith are not a problem. Look what the Bible says. For verily I say to you, the whoso shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not, now here's the key right here, and shall not doubt in his heart. And shall not doubt. Think about your faith as being a vessel like a cup. Okay? Let me ask you a question. If you're filled with faith, and that cup is filled up with faith, okay? Think about a vessel like a cup. And think about your faith. You're putting faith into that cup. If it's filled with faith, let me ask you a question. How much room for doubt is there? The right answer is none. Amen? Why do we doubt? We doubt because we're not filled with faith. I think about the, the original spies. There were 12 of them who were sent into the promised land. And they were sent there by Moses to spy out the land by Joshua uh, earlier when they went into the land, but by Moses previously. And they were sent to the land, and of course, of those 12 spies that went, there were only two, Joshua and Caleb, that came back filled with faith and said it's a good land. And though, though it's a land filled with strong walls and, and, and cities, and though the, the, the inhabitants are giants, we believe that our God is bigger. I like what the preacher from India said yesterday. He said this about God. He said that our God is large and He's in charge. Amen? And you know the reality is that's, that was the perspective that Joshua and Caleb had 
when it came to going out and conquering the land. They, they knew that God, the God who had opened the Red Sea, the God who had sent the plagues down upon Egypt, they knew that that God was big enough to give them the victory when they went into that promised land. And they believed that they could. You know something? Ten of them voted against it. Uh, that, was, uh, that was the first Baptist church split. They had ten were again, two four, and the ten were wrong, and the two uh, the two that were four were right. Amen? So don't ever trust democracy. Never forget that democracy put Jesus on the cross. Amen? And you know, when you're filled with faith, you're not going to be in the majority. You're going to be in the minority. Because most people are looking for reasons why it can't be done. Those who are filled with faith are people who are trusting God for it to be done. And so, we need to be filled with faith. But if our, if our glass is filled with faith, there's no room for doubt. Look what the Bible says here in this passage. The Bible says, very plainly here, Be thou, be thou, remove and be cast and see, and shall not doubt in his heart. He said, well, pastor, how do I get the doubt out? The only way is by filling yourself more up with the Word of God. Amen? The more, I, the more I fill my heart with God's Word and see what God does and begin to see God in all of His power and all of His promises, the more my trust increases. You know, it's kind of like with all my children, now my grandchildren, I will tell them, jump to Grandpa. The other day I was there with a little Bella and we were at the pool and we said, jump to us. You know, and she was reluctant. But once she jumped and realized Grandpa was going to catch her and not let her drown, so it became a gain to her. In other words, trust became easy. It was not easy at the first time. You know, as Christians were that way, the first time we're called upon to trust God entirely. You know, I think about this dear lady who suffered for those uh, for an entire year. Can you imagine ladies being captured by terrorists? <clears throat> Never ever seen the hard side of life and for a year in the, in, the, in the captivity of terrorists being marched through jungles. No showers. No good food. No clean water. And literally being, being herded through the jungles of a, of a Filipino island. Can you imagine what that would be like? You know, she said, she said, I saw myself for the first time like I really was. And she said, I was convicted over that. Over the fact that she realized how, how empty her real faith was. She was discovering for the first time what it was like to really have her faith tested. And then can you imagine having your, the dearest one to your heart, your own husband, killed right there beside you, and you've been wounded? Can you imagine what it would be like to go through something like that? I, I can't even imagine what that must have been like for a lady who grew up in the, in the United States in Kansas to find herself on a mission field, never believing for a moment she would ever have encounter something like she went through. You know, the reality is that her faith, because she was saved, did not diminish at that time. It was strengthened today. I was thinking today that God's given us another Corey Ten Boom. Amen? Here's a, it just seems like God always has another one that will come and inspire us and encourage us. Like some of the great saints. If you weren't inspired by Corey Ten Boom, you need to be. She's with the Lord now, but what a woman of God she was. And she also went through a time of great difficulty in the Nazis. What I'm saying is God always keeps on raising up another one to be a testimony to a new generation of the faithfulness and the power and the strength of God. You know, as a result of her testimony... Four of those terrorists that were their captors who are sitting in a Filipino prison today because of what they've done, four of them have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and she's had a part of ministering to them and saying, no, no, you did this to us. We forgive you. And she's extended the grace of God to them. And those, those men have gotten saved. Former terrorists have, have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Yeah, they're in prison, probably deserve to be there. But you know something? You never know what God's going to do. Would you pray for your captor? Would you pray for your terrorists? You want if you're not filled with faith, amen, for the one who brings that upon you. Oh, I think about this today. Are you and I filled with faith? Jesus said, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. Look at verse 24. Therefore I say to you, what things shall you desire when you pray? Here's the key. Believe that you receive them, and he shall have them. Let me ask you a question this morning, church. Do you believe the Bible? Amen. What are some things that we ought to be praying for? Do we pray for souls for our church that way? Do we pray for a youth pastor for our church that way? Do we pray for ministries that our church needs that way? And I don't mean just as a church when you're together in the prayer meeting. What about at home? Do you really pray for those things that our church has needs of right now? You know, your family has needs. And obviously, I, I would hope as a Christian, you pray about those needs. 
But how many times do we as a church family, individually in our closet, pray about the needs that our church has? Does our church have needs? Yes. You know why? Because churches are imperfect. There's not a church in America that's not imperfect. Some churches have to have, have great strengths in one area, weaknesses in other areas. But do we pray? And are we a part of making up those gaps and making up those areas where there's need? Do we really pray in faith believing? Look what Jesus said here in this passage. He said, Therefore I say to you that what things serving you desire, when you pray, believe that you shall receive them, you shall have them. And I understand there's other scripture that goes along with that. We need to be praying in the will of God. We need to be praying. Our prayer request should be for the glory of God and not for our own glory or not just to consume something upon our own lusts. And there are other scriptures to be borne in mind. But the question is, are we, are we filled with faith? Are we filled with faith? And so our faith is to be filled entirely to the brand. Look at, look at Matthew 21 for a moment. Matthew 21. Turn with me to verse 18. Matthew 21, verse 18. Just another affirmation of what I've read for you in Turn with me to Matthew 21. Look at verse 18 in God's Word. We know these verses, but I think we need some preaching on them. Amen? Uh, Matthew 21, is, do I have the right passage here? Yes, I, I, I turned to the wrong one. Let me find my way here. Okay, let's look at verse, verse 18. Now in the morning, as he returned in the city, he hungered. Now, as he hungers, he sees a fig tree. Look at verse 18. When he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said, that, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. I don't pray a lot of churches for nothing but leaves. Fruit trees are for fruit bearing. Jesus had a need. He was hungry. He comes to the tree where he should have been able to find things, and he finds nothing on the leaves only. Well, let's read on here the word of God. Well, the Bible says that he said that let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever, and presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the tree withered away? See, all Jesus has to do is speak. Amen. All he has to do is speak the word. There's no limit to his power. He, he spoke the world in existence. He's the creator. He created the word of the world by the word of God. All he had to do is speak. But look what Jesus said in verse 21, and they marveled. And Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say to you, if you have faith, if you have faith, a church will never spiritually move forward without a pastor that is filled with faith and without a people that are filled with faith. It will never move forward. It will stand still. It will go backwards. But a church will never move forward without a faith-filled pastor, a leader, and a faith-filled people. When God chose a successor to Moses, He didn't choose those other ten men that we don't know their names. Amen. By the way, the names of all the spies are in the Bible. You know that? But one of the two, you remember. One of the two. You can call back to me. What were their names? What were they? Joshua. Joshua and him. Why do we know their names? Because they were filled with faith. They were filled with faith. By the way, it's sort of true also the first two deacons, or the first seven deacons. Most people, if you were to ask them, can you name the seven deacons? Most of us couldn't. We'd have to go look it up. But who would, who would be the two that we would remember? Probably Stephen and <laughs> Philip. Amen. I'm not saying the other ones were, were no good. But, but the ones whose faith accomplished something are the ones that we remember. By the way, church history is that way, amen? I mean, for the most part of church history, we remember the names of men and women who have made a mark. And why did they make a mark? Because they were people filled with faith. They believed God to do some things, amen? And then that's what makes them stand out. And that's why I posed the question this morning to each of us today, myself as well as you, are you and I filled with faith like Stephen was? Now, second of all, there was a second characteristic. And that was that he was spirit-filled. Here's the second question, really. Are you spirit-filled right now? Now, I will say this this morning very plainly to you. If sometime from the time that you got up this morning until you walked into church this morning, if you did not consciously ask God to fill you with, your, with His Spirit, you're probably not spirit-filled. Now, the exception might be that you may have asked God last night before you went to sleep, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. You say, well... Pastor, is that necessary? Yes. The Bible says He gives the Holy Spirit to them that ask. And then when we do not recognize our need, we don't ask. I don't know about you, but I normally don't ask for things that I don't think I need. Do you? Okay? I just don't do that. And you probably don't do as well. 
You know why we don't ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit more frequently? Because we don't really believe we need Him more frequently. We tend to compartmentalize our life when we say, well, I'm getting ready to go solo, so I better ask God to fill me with the Spirit. Or I'm getting ready to teach a class, or I'm getting ready to lead singing, or I'm getting ready to do what we would deem a spiritual work, and then we'll say, now God fill me with your Spirit. But you know something? I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to be a good husband to my wife. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to be a good daddy to my girls. Amen? They're still at home. I need to be Spirit-filled in every facet. But why do we so often operate by natural power instead of supernatural? It's because we go along to get along. And if you did not take time even this morning to say, Lord, please empty me of myself, fill me with the Holy Spirit again afresh and anew, probably we came to church under natural power. Do you realize that if every Christian came to church every Sunday <coughs> empty and filled, mm -hmm. how much of the power of God we would experience in our, in, our, in our meetings? If we literally took serious what it means to be spirit-filled, we expect our preacher to be spirit-filled. We expect our Sunday school teacher to be spirit-filled. We expect people in, in place of leaders, but we forget that the entire body of Christ, every Christian needs the filling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's one of the greatest needs today. These men that were chosen to be deacons in the early church were not only men that were filled with faith, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were Spirit-filled, Spirit-energized men. And the last point goes right with it because they were empowered. The power of the Holy Spirit was upon them. It was undeniable. And so they were filled with power. What the Bible says here about, about Stephen? The Bible says here about Stephen, let's go back here in the Word of God, and I'm going to come back to the book of, of Matthew 21, so hold your place there. We go back to Acts just for a moment. Acts chapter 6. And I want you just to take note of what, what it says about Stephen. Now you say, well, preacher, where will it get me if I'm filled with faith, and I'm filled with the Spirit, and I'm filled with power? Well, it might get you stoned, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened to Stephen, amen? It could lead you down the road of martyrdom. I don't know. I don't think so. Probably you'd go solo this week and not get killed for it in Kokomo, amen? Now that may not happen if you're in a Muslim country and you're out there preaching and soul winning. You may, you may find your life in peril. But you know, we're not talking about, you know, name it, claim it, get healthy and wealthy, amen? That's not what I'm preaching on this morning, amen? I'm not Joel Steen and don't claim to be and don't want to be, okay? But, but Stephen stood and preached in the power of the Spirit. Look what the Bible says here in verse, in verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Look at verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the Spirit by which he spake. The Bible says, and they were stubborn men, which said, We have heard these two blasphemous words against Moses. But look what the Bible says in this passage. And the Bible says in verse 14, We have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all of the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it been a face of an angel. I'm telling you, there was a, a remarkable supernatural power that rested upon Stephen. And this was a direct result of a man that was filled with faith, believing God, and also the fact that he was a spirit-filled Christian. And by the way, there's no limit to God's Holy Spirit. You and I can be that way today. We can be the same kind of Christian today that Stephen was hundreds of years ago. We may not lay down our life for our faith as Stephen did, but we can be a people that are filled with faith, filled with the Spirit, filled with power. We should never forget Acts chapter 1-8. The Bible says, But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. I'm, I'm really convinced of this this morning. The reason why Christians are not witnesses is because they are not spirit-filled Christians. And so what are we called upon as believers to be? We're called to be filled with faith. We're called to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We are called to be filled with power. Now let's go back and touch on that passage in Matthew 21 because I didn't really cover it. Look at verse 21. Very barely I say to you, if you have faith and doubt not, he shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also thou shalt say to this mountain, Be thou removed and cast in the sea, and it shall be done. And here's a wonderful prayer promise that you should underline, and that you should memorize, and that you should meditate upon. 
And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer. And here's the key. Believing. You shall receive. There's a lot of things we ask God in prayer. But do we ask it believing? Do we really ask it in faith? That's God's promise. That's not Pastor Green's promise for you today, man. That's not just the word of Matthew, even though it's in the Gospel of Matthew. This is a promise from God through Matthew. And from the very voice of Jesus, it's the very words of Christ to us. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. You say, Pastor, what is our need today then? Well, we need to have our faith increased. That's why we're here this morning. You've come to church. You're hearing the preaching of the Word of God. I do my best as a pastor. And by God's grace, I hope you pray for me. But I do my best to preach the Word of God to you. Why do I do that? Because, number one, I've been given a charge by Jesus Christ Himself to preach the Word. But second of all, nothing will benefit you more than the preaching and the expounding upon God's Word. We need the Word of God to preach us, and we need to preach convictingly. You say, well, preacher, sometimes your preaching makes me uncomfortable. Well, thank God for it. Amen? I don't want us to be comfortable. We are too comfortable. I will guarantee you when we went to that conference yesterday, it made me realize, like nothing else, that we are just too comfortable in, in America. Mm -hmm. America is sitting on their hands waiting for Jesus to come while our country is deteriorating around us. But we're like a person suffering from a bad case of depression that doesn't want to go anywhere, doesn't want to do anything, and just wants to be paralyzed by fear and depression. Right. And you know something? 90% of what's going on in Washington, D.C., you and I cannot do a thing about it. The best we can do is be thoroughly right with God, pray for our nation, have personal revival, get out and vote, but then try to win someone to Jesus. Amen? I mean, what else are you going to do? You can sit right depressed. In fact, maybe you ought to just shut off Fox News. Amen? And shut off all the other news sources and say, you know what? I'm going to get closer to God. I'm going to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to do my best to be the best Christian that I can possibly be. Amen. The greatest need in our country is for Christians to really be Christians. I think our problem is our faith is so absolutely pathetic. And I don't even like to use that word that way because it's not really the meaning of it again. But our faith is so anemic and so weak compared to some of these Christians around the world and what they are, what God is doing through them. And I look at our country and I don't want to pray for persecution to have to come here, but I know one thing, it wouldn't hurt us a bit. Amen. It might hurt us physically, but it wouldn't hurt us spiritually. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not volunteering to be the first one to put my mouth, my head in a lion's mouth. Amen. But what I'm trying to say today is this: What will it take for American Christians to wake up and get stirred up and get excited about Jesus Christ? Amen. And get excited about what you're seeing. If this has been weeks and months since you've even witnessed anyone, don't come to church and, and, and put on a pious front and say I'm a great Christian. If you're not even doing the minimum that Jesus commanded, I, and I don't want to get in the flesh of why I'm preaching today. Amen. I don't want to. I'm not trying to elevate myself. I understand that I need what I'm preaching as much as you need it today. But I try by the grace of God to never let a week go by that I don't witness to someone and give them the gospel. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I find great joy in it. It's, it's, it's a joy to me. His commandments are not grievous. It's a joy to go out and to share with the lost world what Jesus Christ, number one, what He did in my life when He saved me. You said, well, you got saved a long time ago. Yes, I did, but I just didn't get over it. Man, I'm still excited about it today. And I love to share my testimony. Sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm sharing my testimony with someone, and maybe it's at the jail, maybe it's at the door, or maybe it's someone that knows me. And they're shocked to know that Pastor Green had passed. I mean, they think, well, he's always been this godly Christian. Amen? And I'm not trying to say that I am, because by the grace of God, I am what I am. But they don't know that I had a beastly life. You know something, your friends that you work with don't know that either. Your neighbor that you live next door to. Can you imagine living next door to a neighbor and never even one time ever giving them the gospel and you live with a living son all those years and you never even one time witnessed it? you realize how many Christian people, now listen to me today, will live next door to someone and never one time. And I'm not talking about inviting people to church. That's not witnessing. Okay? Let's clear that up. Okay? Inviting people to church is not witnessing. Witnessing is sharing with people, I was lost. I was undone. I was on my way to hell. I came to discover I was a sinner. I came to discover that there was a Savior that went to the cross. And I became And He forgave me. 
way of information to give for the issue. Amen. That's what it's doing. You say, well, I'm not a theologian. Do you have to be a theologian to show that? No. You just have to be a redeemed soul. Amen? Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but that began when I got saved. I got such a burden for my loved ones, my, my neighbors, my relatives, friends. I got such a burden for From the time I got saved, I got a burden to tell someone, somewhere, anywhere about Jesus. Amen. And I can honestly say, by the grace of God, I may have over it. Amen. It's as much joy to me today. Sure, the lost said it was what Jesus did. It was what was said to me. Our church was full of people who made it. Claimed to be saved. They never witnessed. They, they, they seem to have no joy. We got to get back to Christian. Amen. Amen. Witnessing is not going through some little prescribed method. It's sharing from your heart yeah. what Jesus did when he saved you. You said, well, some people will reject it. Yes, they will. I had friends when I got saved. I went to you and said, see you later. We're done with you. Okay? Some of them called me years later and said, can you help me? <laughs> what I'm saying is, Christian, we need to take this matter of being a Christian a lot more seriously today than what we do. We, we're playing at Christianity. Well, the suffering church is praying. We're playing at our Christianity. Let's get a burden. Amen? Let's get a burden for our community, for our city. There are people out here dying. I'm so burdened. We've had so many people that I've witnessed to and ministered to that have died, tragic, OD, deaths. And you know, I, I admit it, we work with the inner city people. I mean, we work with them. Daniel and I, I mean, that's what our ministry is. It's been a ministry to reaching people that are going through rough times, drug people that battle with alcohol, people that battle with drugs. But I don't see any more die. There's a young lady that I've been burdened for, and I began to work with her probably 10 years ago. And she's 31 now. And she got back in jail with me. And I went to her, I pulled her out there, and I said, Nicole, I said, if you don't, if you don't get things together, you're going to be another one of these casualties. And I said, you know, I commented to you when you got out of jail. And I encouraged you. I said, you never came to church one time. I said, now you're out here living in a camp. 31 years of age. I said, you know what? You're going to be just like my name. Some of these other people have got us. You're going to be just like them. I said, don't you know you have a preacher that cares about you and loves you? And wants to see you follow Jesus Christ? I said, how is doing your own way getting you? Where's it getting you? And she found an addiction. She went in there all messed up on drugs. What I'm saying is, this is the real world outside the doors of our, of our churches. If you don't care about it, it will. You know what David said? David said, refuge failed me. Man failed me. He said, no man cared for my soul. The greatest need in our country is churches that genuinely, genuinely, genuinely care about the destiny of sinners and whether they're going to spend eternity. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, forgive us for our lack of faith. Forgive us for operating in natural power, not supernatural. Forgive us for not operating under your divine, omnipotent power. Speak to our hearts. Work in our church, Father. Bring revival right here to this body. And I pray in Jesus' name. We're going to